Welcome to Baby Boomer Tales. My name is Jim. Thank you for riding along today. You can find us at babyboomertales.com. Once you've arrived at our webpage, there are links to where you can hear our podcast, find our Twitter page, our LinkedIn page, our YouTube channel, our Boomers General Store. You can also write us at babyboomertales at gmail.com. Yesterday, we went to clean our lagoon. Not sure what a lagoon is. It's our sewer pond, for a better word of it. 650 feet away from the house, we have a sewage lagoon back there. And it really does work very well. I've never had one bit of problems with anything sewer related at all. The only time you ever would know that it is a sewer lagoon besides a fence surrounding it so that no dogs or basically any animals can get into it. It's a wonderful thing, but it is not animal proof because we can see a muskrat swimming in there once in a while and see some telltale signs that muskrats have been in there. They like to dig up the banks around any kind of body of water at all. Well, over the years, the willows and trees and alders and all that stuff want to grow up inside that fence line. Years ago, I had my firewood guy. I hired him to cut all that wood out of there and throw it in a brush pile over there by the lagoon. Well, I tried to get him to do that again about five years ago, and he said, no way, I'm not going to do that again. He's getting kind of long in the tooth, and doesn't want to do some of that hard work, and I don't blame him. I don't want to do it. But we went down there last spring, cut a bunch of stuff out of there. Now, this spring, a year later, a lot of that willow and stuff has grown back. And it's hard to get in there, basically. You know, you have about three feet, four feet maybe, between the fence and the water. And after muskrats have decimated part of the bank area, you could fall in. That's one thing I do not want to do. I do not want to fall into the lagoon. I was wearing rubber gloves and rubber boots and stuff. So this year I contemplated and thought it out and decided that we would take the fence down to get to those trees and be much easier. I have a weed eater type machine that has a blade with chainsaw teeth on it. And it works like a champ. It cuts down up to three inch trees, just easy as can be. It sure beats taking your chainsaw and bending over and trying to get all that stuff down low, you know, 100 little trees in a small little area. So we proceeded to take that fence down, and it was hard, hard work. Trees growing up in it and vines growing up in it. And it had been 23 years, and the ground had kind of grown up around the bottom of the fence. It's a wire type fence, kind of like chicken wire almost, but not really. It's not pig wire, it's not chicken wire. I guess it's lagoon wire. So we worked a big chunk of the day just getting that wire out. Well, about halfway down the line of the one side of the fence, there was the largest snapping turtle I have ever seen in my life. Just lay in there. First, I thought maybe his dad, so I kind of looked over. Now, the fence was between me and him, or I would probably wouldn't have got as close. Those guys can harm you bad. And he did open his eyes and kind of move. His front end was kind of higher than his back end. It was kind of in this little ditch. And we worked around there for a couple hours, and he never moved. I got down there. I started looking at him and talking to him. First, I thought maybe he was protecting a nest of eggs, you know, turtle lays eggs. Then I decided this guy is not a female, number one. He had to weigh 50 pounds. He was huge. His head was bigger than two of my fists together. The biggest snapping turtle I ever saw in my life. And he wasn't moving. So once we got the fence pulled out by where he was, and he still just kind of sat there, laid there. I took a shovel and I kind of got it behind his rear end and I got him out of that. He was stuck. He was stuck. I don't know how long he'd been there, but if we hadn't gone down there to fix that lagoon, get all those trees out, I never would have seen him. When I first saw him, I thought it was a tree stump. 
And so then he was in the water. I got him in the water. He kind of laid there for 30 seconds or something. And I thought, you know, maybe he's dying. Then all of a sudden he started to move and he started to swim and he swam a ways. Then he submerged himself and went under the water. And I think we rescued our friend the snapping turtle. Our unusual fact this week, turtles have been around about 200 million years. Their shell is part of their skeleton. The largest turtle has been known to weigh 1,500 pounds. A small little bog turtle can be as small as four inches long. Most species of turtles have five toes on each limb. The oldest turtle was on Tonga Island. This is the oldest one ever recorded. 188 years old. <coughs> Thinking about saving that old turtle yesterday made me remember some of the wildlife I've encountered in my life. Now, I have lived 94.5% of my life either in a small town or in the country. So that means 5.5% of my life I've lived in the city. Now, I'm not against city living, don't get me wrong here. I'm just comfortable in a less populated environment. I don't mind going to the city, but my idea of the city anymore is the suburbs. Or, you know, a town of 100,000, like Lawrence, Kansas, when school's not going. I call that the city. I don't like to go into the inner city too much. And that's where a lot of the cultural stuff or the sporting venues are and stuff. So I've lived in small communities and country all my life. And so I've been around quite a bit of wildlife. So I've had some encounters with non-domestic animals. And I want to talk about some of these times. Now I'm not going to talk about hunting. I don't know if you're pro or con against hunting. That doesn't matter to me. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm just talking about chance encounters, basically. Or maybe encounters that I saw something out in the yard and I ran out to get it, like a turtle. You know, I have turtles around here, leatherback turtles. You can see them sunning on fallen trees in the pond. I have one willow I can see from my office window. And in the summertime, there's a bunch of shiny objects over there. And it may be eight or ten turtles laying on some of those willow branches that have sloughed down into the water. So let me start here. I've addressed some of these in previous podcasts. So we'll try to not talk about them as in detail as I did on other podcasts. But I will probably mention them. After 225 podcasts, you're bound to tell some of the same stuff more than once. At least I am. Let's go down here. Porcupines. I've had lots of encounters with porcupines when I lived in Colorado. My most memorable one was when I was five years old and one was standing in the road when I was trying to get home from school. Also, when I was about six or seven, a rancher came to our school and came to the classroom, talked to my teacher for a minute, and then all of a sudden we were all filing outside. We went to his pickup, and he had a two-headed calf. It had been born dead, but it had two heads. I can still remember that. I remember what part of the parking lot I can't remember the color of his truck, and I have no idea who the rancher was. Sometimes I think it might have been my first grade teacher's husband, but I'm not sure about that. Skunks, I've had lots of encounters with skunks, but one main encounter where he sprayed, and I thought I got sprayed, and thank goodness I didn't, but I smelled that smell for a week. It totally permeated my nose membranes. My brain was skunked out. Raccoons, I caught a raccoon once, and he really wasn't wild, but a raccoon is a wild animal, but this guy must have caught him and tried to domesticate him, or bought a baby raccoon and tried to domesticate him. And I can speak from experience, you can't domesticate a raccoon, even if he has a collar on. I saw a wolf one time between the town I lived in and a little town I used to go to up by Wyoming. He's on this pass. And there's snow banks very tall on both sides of the road. And here's right in the middle of the road. I know it was a wolf. They're bigger than a dog. He's up there in the middle of nowhere by himself. He looked just like what you would see in Cabela's Sporting Goods. You go to one of those and see the taxidermy mounts. 
There's some amazing mounts in places like that. And I saw me a wolf. Nowadays, they've released wolves back into the Colorado mountains. And it's a big controversy. And I'm not going to talk about that. All I know is I saw one about 60 years ago. Maybe 50 years ago. Coyote. Now, coyotes are everywhere. I, I think they're everywhere. You can see them, you know, in the suburbs and probably the city. A lot of people talk about how aggressive coyotes are. People are afraid of them and stuff. I've never had a, one situation with a coyote. And I have them around here. I saw one yesterday. Walk in front of my office window sometimes in the early, early morning. Never bothered me or mine ever. I have a fondness in my heart for coyotes. A friend of mine had a dog that was half Siberian Husky and half coyote. One of the coolest dogs I ever knew. Besides mine, of course, my dogs. Bobcats and fox. Now, I don't have many encounters with them, but I saw a fox yesterday also. Maybe it was day before yesterday, yeah. So I was driving, I was about a mile from home on the old country gravel dirt road. Used to be a den of foxes up about a mile and a half from me. They lived in a culvert. The culvert must have been plugged. And every spring you'd see pups. Well, I haven't seen any of them lately. Bobcats, I've seen a couple crossing the road as I was driving down these gravel roads. Mountain lion, I talked about having a mountain lion right over by my barn one time. My dog chased it, freaked me out before I could get out to it. She chased that mountain lion off. They don't want to fight with anything that they think they'll get hurt. So unless you're a little kid, you're probably pretty safe from a mountain lion. But a little kid might look like a young deer to a lion. So watch your kids whenever you're out in the wilderness. Moose. Now you can go up to my home county where I was raised and see a moose about every trip you go up there. But that wasn't the case when I was a kid. They introduced them into that part of the country. So the first moose I ever saw in the wild was up in Ontario. A male moose with that full rack is a beautiful, huge, beautiful animal. Same way with bears. I've only seen a bear uh, several times out in the wild, never here in Kansas. But in Ontario again, I saw a grizzly bear standing, standing, you know, on two legs on some railroad tracks. None of these count like when I was in Yellowstone or in Rocky Mountain National Park. We used to go up there, listen to the elk bugle. Elk are an amazing, beautiful thing. The closest ch chance encounter I ever had with elk was west of my hometown. Is a little mountain called Elk Mountain. That's what we called it anyway. And me and my dogs were hiking up there one time. My dogs always took off and then they come back. You know, Once in a while they chase a deer into you or something. But they'd close. They were within a mile. They'd come if I called. And I was in... A grove of aspen trees, and it was heavily wooded, and all of a sudden, it sounded like a train was coming at me, and it couldn't have been 10 feet away. A herd of elk ran past me, just knocking trees down, getting out of there, and the only thing I could theorize is the dogs must have spooked them and ran them down the mountain. If they would have run over me, they would have killed me for sure, and not meaning to, they were just skedaddling from something, and probably my dogs. We had mule deer back in Colorado. I never did like to eat them. They always tasted so gamey and wild. A mule deer eat a lot of sagebrush. The white-tailed deer in this country, they like those farmer's fields and the lush grass that grows around here. And they do taste better, I'll tell you that. They're smaller and they do look different. And I have a lot of them around here. Just a whole lot of them around here. I like to see the babies. I do. I like to see the babies. I don't really like them to be too close to the house because they'll eat your bushes and rub up against your baby trees and rub the bark off or eat your baby trees. I had one deer one time eating my watermelons. So I'd rather have coyotes around here than deer. But deer are very beautiful and very pretty and I do like seeing them. While turkeys... Had a wild turkey here just the other day. Just one of them, which is odd. You usually see them in flocks. Is that what you call it? A bunch of turkeys are walking around. Now, I don't know if I've ever seen a turkey fly. And I have never hunted turkeys. And maybe you'd see that then. 
I'm not going to talk too much about birds, but when we first bought this property, there were quail all over the place. You know, Bob White, Bob White, Bob White. And my dogs, they scared the quail off, and the quail have never come back. I've, I don't hear quail on this property at all. I wish they would, because the turkeys came back, you know. Really, I only saw turkeys one time all the years I had dogs. So, besides wild turkeys, I've seen eagles, the bald eagles I've been talking about over on my dam. Also seen a golden eagle on the other side of the pond. Up towards Wyoming, north of my little hometown, you can see these antelope running. And correct me if I'm wrong, but how I remember them getting through a fence, they almost wouldn't even slow down. And unlike a deer jumping over a fence, they would kind of duck under it and just keep trucking along. It's an amazing sight. So I'm not talking about birds, snakes, frogs, any kind of amphibians except for the turtles. Muskrats, as I said, they swim around in the early morning. I haven't seen one in a long time, and I've worked real hard at eradicating them, but they don't just pick one pond and stay there forever. They move from pond to stream to ditch to lake to ditch to stream to pond, etc. Beaver. I had a beaver out here once before, and I don't want beavers around here. They are cutting down my trees and everything else. Now, please, don't get me wrong. I like beavers. I think they are fascinating to watch and how they do their thing. But I just don't want them tearing up my pond, which they would do. They definitely would do that. And I'm not going to talk about rabbits and squirrels because you can see them anywhere. Right now, though, I'm seeing rabbits on my front porch. You never would have saw that when old Maxie Dog was alive. I enjoy living in the country, that's for sure. The sun rises, the sun sets, the pond, what it goes through, and how on a day with a light breeze it looks like just this huge pile of diamonds over there. Walking out at night and seeing a million stars, looking to the northeast and seeing the lights of the city, you can tell something's there. Watching nature all around me and feeling the tranquility that this boring old life can bring. I'm surprised I rescued that turtle yesterday because ever since we've lived out here, you find snapping turtles dead on the road. These old boys around here will run over on, and you can't blame them. Snapping turtle will bite your finger off. I know a girl that that happened to her dad, and the weird thing about it is he had cut that turtle's head off of him five minutes before, and then it still snapped and bit his finger off. I told a story one time about killing one because my cat was involved with him and I thought it was going to kill the cat and how it kind of came back and came back and came back kind of like a horror movie but I must be getting soft I've never seen a turtle that big before 50 pound snapping turtle they're usually much smaller than that he was huge he had to be fairly old and I'm not going to kill something just to kill it I don't care if it was a snapping turtle or not Always be kind, wherever you go, whatever you encounter. It's not a bad way to live. I'll be back next Wednesday. Peace out.